Hello, good day everyone, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. So we are uh, right to start our next TinyML talks. The talk is about state of hardware and software ecosystem for low power ML applications on RIX-5 architecture. Our speakers are Bilal Zafar, co-founder and CEO, 10X Engineers AI, and Mohammed Kamran, compiler engineer at 10X Engineers. I am Avas Binalta, assistant professor in electrical engineering department, Lahore University of Management Sciences, Pakistan. Before we move forward, we would like to thank our tiny ML strategic partners, analog devices, Aeon devices, ARM, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Emza, PhotoHub, GreenWaves, Gravity, HOTG, Imagey MOV, ITMRS, Kilka Tech, Latent AI, NXP Semiconductors, Profis, Oxio, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Rexion, Renesas, SAP, Seed, SensiML, Sony Semiconductor Solutions, Life Augmented ST, Stream Analyze, Synaptics, Synsense, and Sentient. I would like to remind regarding our TinyML Summit, which happened in March 28 and 30, 2022. It was in-person session, but all the presentations are available on tinyml.org and the videos will be available, are also available on the YouTube link. So please do watch them. Also about the next TinyML Trailblazer series, the success stories with Terry Morio, co-founder and VP Technology Partnerships, OctoML, uh, will be live on 4th May, 2022 at 8 a.m. Pacific time. So you can register uh, following the link and also the QR code. The, the tiny ML uh, community is growing up. So the meetup, we have 9.2K members having 45 group in 35 countries. So you can just also register your group, your country, and you can start participating it. Also, the tiny ML community on the LinkedIn is continually growing. We are 2.8K members with 6.7K uh, followers. So the links are available. You can register and you can start contributing. Uh, all the videos, previous one, and this video, uh, this current uh, today's talk will be available on the YouTube channel of the TinyML. The link is available, youtube.com, TinyML. Please do subscribe to get updates about the new videos and all the previous videos you can access. So the, more than 6.6 uh, 6 subscribers are there with 363 videos are available, which can be accessed to get all the information. And the next tiny ML talk is on Friday, May 6th, is from Anyone Sivan, lead engineer on the computer vision platform value. The title of the talk is Industry 4.0, predictive maintenance using Arduino, Fortino, H7, and Edge Impulse. The webcast will start at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And if you are interested to uh, present your work, you can also contact talks at tinyml.org. So now let me introduce our speaker. So we have two speakers. The first is Bilal Zafar, is the co-founder and CEO of 10X Engineers, a semiconductor design and verification services company with a strong focus on Risk V. Uh, they partner with some of the leading ASIC and Risk V IP design companies to help accelerate their time to market through team augmentation. As a strategic and development partner of Risk V International, they contribute to specific definition and adoption. Previously, Bilal also worked as a principal engineer at Qualcomm. He holds a PhD in computer engineering from the University of Southern California. Mohammed Kamran uh, is a compiler engineer at 10X Engineers, uh, working on LLVM backend for the RISC-V development. He is exploring frameworks for lowering machine learning models to RISC-V hardware and is actively involved in the RISC-V international graphics and ML special interest group. Now I would like to invite uh, Bilal Zaf to start the talk on hardware and software ecosystem for low power ML applications on this five architecture. It's over to Bilal. Thank you, Wes. Um, thank you everyone for joining. I'm Bilal, uh, myself and my colleague Kamran will be talking about risk five ecosystem and how um, this ecosystem essentially can enable you to 
uh, work on your low power applications. Uh, this is my first time uh, on a, a tiny ML talk, so very excited to have uh, to be here. And let's get started. So, what is this talk about? Uh, so, this talk is really your introduction to the Risk Five world. Uh, this is not meant for people who are intimately familiar with Risk Five. Uh, this is for people who are probably software engineers uh, who have seen Risk Five pop up in their news feeds and are curious what's going on. So we've done some background work to bring you up to speed on what's happening in the Risk Five world. This is our view of the ecosystem. This is by no means comprehensive. So if I miss out anything, that's not intentional. That's just that uh, we had to. Uh, limit ourselves to what we can do in this quick talk. And so the target audience really are software engineers and embedded hardware engineers who really are not very familiar with RISC-V, but would like to know what's happening in this space. As we go through this talk, you'll realize that RISC-V ecosystem is very new and still evolving. So there's a lot to understand in terms of the maturity of the ecosystem, and hopefully this talk will bring out some of them. So let's, uh, let's get going. Before we talk about what's the state of the art in RISC-V, let's talk about instruction set architectures, why they're important or why they're not important. Um, there's a instruction set architecture really is a contract between the hardware and the software. This is the language in which the software speaks with the hardware. These are the instructions that are implemented in hardware. The high level software gets compiled into these low level instructions and these instructions are what the hardware understands. That's something that we've all learned in our computer architecture uh, programs. There's a very famous saying from Jim Keller, who was for a long time uh, architect at AMD and later at Intel and Apple as well, that 80% of the execution happens on six instructions, load, store, add, subtract, compare, and branch. So if that's the case, if really the only instructions that matter are these six instructions, then why all this fuss about uh, instruction set architecture? So that's true, that in general, instruction set architectures or um, instructions that are implemented in hardware are not super important. Um, for people working at the software, this is the least of their concerns. Uh, and that's true because the performance gains to be had from adding new instructions are usually fairly small. And this has been true. If you look at if you look at the mobile era over the last 15, 20 years, uh, when it comes to handheld computing, whether it is phones or tablets, ARM architecture has been dominant and 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 it has worked out well. Uh, x86 has not been able to make growth. But then there's another there's an important question here, which is that if x86 based architectures are so dominant in desktop computing um, world, whether it's laptops, PCs or servers, uh, how come they were not successful in the mobile uh, computing world? And similarly, if ARM architecture is so awesome, why was it not successful in the x86 in, in the desktop and, and uh, era? So uh, clearly the many people have, have uh, sort of opinions on these. Uh, the way I come down to it is that you really have to, uh, an instruction set architecture is unimportant until you hit an inflection point. And that inflection point has to be an inflection point in technology, but also in business sense. So uh, let's take the example of, of uh, where we were. So x86 was the stuff of uh, uh, computers were uh, made of back when Michael Jackson was uh, you know, churning out his hits. Um, that remained de facto the standard, even though many other architectures came in. There's Spark and MIPS and many other architectures kind of uh, were uh, played a role, but x86 remained dominant and uh, as, as we went to the maturity of that PC area, x86 became the de facto standard. So that, that worked out well. But then we hit an inflection point when we moved to these battery power devices uh, and a new, not only a new simpler architecture that could run at a lower power was needed, what you also needed was a new business model, a licensing business model where uh, other companies could design SOCs with licensing the architecture. And that's really what ARM offered. So even though ARM had been around since 1985, it really was at that inflection point that it made sense to start using this architecture for the applications that, that we started to see in, in the mobile era. And I think the question now uh, is that, are we hitting another inflection point when it comes to so the history of computing? Are we hitting another inflection point where it's no longer just about desktop and mobile, but we have new applications? And I think it's not too far-fetched to say that we are, that really the axes of performance has been stretched. On one hand, you have applications, real applications, real use cases, where you want to operate at sub milliwatt um, power. And on the other hand, uh, you have applications in ADAS and so forth, where you need supercomputing kind of uh, computational power in by the millions uh, in cars and robots and what have you. So clearly, uh, we seem to be hitting a new inflection point in, in, in computing. And really the question is that is RISC-V 
the architecture for that inflection point. Risk five is uh, an open, free, modular, and extensible ISA. Uh, I'll go a little bit more into details of this. Uh, so it allows you to design your chips without having to pay royalty. That's the free part. It's open so anyone can contribute to defining the ISA or its extensions. And it's modular. So when you're designing an actual processor, you don't have to take the entire kitchen sink. You don't have to take every um, instruction that has been defined. You can take a subset and design your processors based on that subset. And that provides that modularity, the targeting of uh, the SOC for a particular application or a set of applications that really is, is uh, going to be probably the hallmark of this uh, heterogeneous computing era. So let's talk a little bit about the history of RISC-V, how RISC-V came into being. Uh, it started as a university project in UC Berkeley in uh, Krista Isanovich's lab. They were really trying to come up with uh, an architecture for their own uh, research chips and, and trying to make sure that they have a single architecture rather than every grad student doing his own thing. And uh, quickly, Andrew Waterman, who was tasked with coming up with this new ISA, started to realize that the existing ISAs had a lot of technical debt, a lot of junk uh, that was there as part of legacy, which didn't make sense in, 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 in 2010 or 11. So they started to essentially say, we're gonna start from scratch and really come up with an ISA that makes sense for the applications that are of interest in 2010. That's really what the genesis of RISC-V was. It was called RISC-V because it was the fifth generation of RISC architectures coming out of UC Berkeley. Dave Patterson had led groups that had sort of come up with the previous uh, architectures as well and, and Krista. So this effort started as, as a sort of a college project. And for the first four or five years, it was a college project. A uh, team was churning out chips and porting, um, standardizing the spec. And they standardized the RISC-V unprivileged ISA and also privileged ISA ported Linux and really started to talk to the world about this, this new idea that they had come up with, which was an open, which was, uh, well, it was not really a new idea, but a new standard that they've come up with and they wanted the world to adopt. So around 2015 and 16, the world started to pay attention. They registered RISC-V Foundation as a nonprofit um, organization to essentially um, handle the specification process, very similar to how the Linux Foundation works. And, and in parallel, they started this company called Sci-5. So the three original founders of RISC-V Jan Sipley, Andrew Waterman, and Chris Sanovich founded this company called RISC-V to essentially start designing processors based on RISC-V and commercialize it as an IP. So uh, it's important here to sort of talk about uh, what is free and what is not free. So anyone can take the specification and design the processor on that specification without paying royalty. But if you do design a processor and you have an actual design that you wanna sell or a physical chip, then obviously you can charge for that. So you can license the IP that follows the risk five spec. That uh, IP doesn't have to be open source. But true to the ethos of open source and coming out of Berkeley and all that, a lot of companies that first stepped into risk five really um, wanted to contribute to this open source effort. So initially, um, a few companies in, in, in you know, research groups and companies started to actually contribute open source cores um, and, and put it up on GitHub. Um, a, a couple of famous cores came out of Western Digital. This was one of the first companies to uh, both make uh, a commercial grade RISC-V core for internal use, as well as open source it. So these are SWARF cores that they released. Similarly, other companies have followed suit. Uh, Alibaba's processor division called T-Head released last year um, a, a couple of cores, um, high-end and low-end cores. From their side, um, research groups, um, Berkeley included, and uh, from ETH Zurich, there's a pulp platform group uh, run by Luca Bellini. They have put out several very good quality open source cores in RISC-V. So there are these open source cores that you can go download, run it on your FPGA and uh, merely have a RISC-V system working. Or you could actually take those cores and put it on silicon as well and have your own ASIC. Or you can license cores from, from vendors like Sci-5 and Andes and, and go um, actually build your chips using those proprietary cores. Lately, you must have seen sort of news coming out where Intel has uh, gotten behind this effort and actually has joined RISC-V Foundation. So talk about uh, you know life coming full circle. Uh, Intel is now part of the RISC-V Foundation and essentially funding uh, startups that are working in this space. Qualcomm and other major players have been kind of uh, founding partners of RISC-V for a long time. So really, I think this, this is where RISC-V story is starting to become real. I think if we were to find an inflection point where RISC-V story really became real, it was probably uh, sometime in the last two, three years. 
going forward, um, this is one of the plots that has been making rounds in the risk five community as terms uh, in terms of the anticipated growth of risk five cores. So on this graph, you can see the number of risk five cores by the millions um, plotted all the way un until 2025. So it's saying about 60 billion cores of risk five will be in devices uh, in 2025. That's a huge number, obviously, but uh, it's probably not too far off. Um, for example, in 2021, just one company, Andy's Technology, um, advertised that they have about 3 billion devices, 3 billion cores in, in silicon in 2021 uh, using RISC-V, their RISC-V vendor. So um, the, the traction is real. And I think the, the story is real because like I mentioned earlier, right? You have two trends. You have the technology side, which is looking for something simpler to start off, but also something modular that can be extended. But you also have, and this is really important. And this is what is fueling this growth. You also have a business trend, a trade uh, angle to this where different countries are trying to indigenize their supply chains, especially with those of electronics and risk five by the virtue of the fact that it's maintained by an open source organization based in Switzerland essentially allows you to design your ICs using this architecture and not run into uh, IP protection issues. So you've seen announcements being made in the US and China and Europe and very recently in India as well, as well as South Korea to try and indigenize the semiconductor industry. And RISC-V is essentially getting a lot of tailwind because of that. Uh, when countries are entering this, they're clearly seeing that this offers us an IP free way of kind of uh, entering this market into the processor domain. So I think combine these, uh, combining these two trends, a pure technology trend and a little bit of trade side uh, angle to it is really producing this business model that, that makes a lot of sense for RISC-V and that's the traction that we're seeing today. We started looking at RISC-V in 2018. I can tell you at the time, this seemed like just an outgrown research project and not really something that that was uh, of a great commercial value. But in just the last three years, the, the transformation has been huge. So today we'll talk about the state of the hardware and software ecosystem on risk five. Like I mentioned, it's not supposed to be a comprehensive view, but it's supposed to give you a flavor of where things are. So that if you have a question, then obviously you, you can ask us or you can go Google it away. So we've done some homework for you. Um, so this is really a TLDR version of, of where is risk five. So let's start with the risk five specification and what is contained in there. So now the fact that I'm starting this presentation by talking about the specification tells you that things are still in flux, that the risk five specification is not set in stone. It's not defined yet. It's not complete yet. And that's what you'll see. So I wanted to introduce you so that when you're looking at different risk five processors, you can actually identify what features they have, what, what, and how compliant they are to the standard and what their longevity would be and what their support structure would look like. So let's look at the RISC-V specification. The one word you hear um, sort of often is that RISC-V is modular, open source, and still evolving. And that's really what you should keep in mind as we discuss these things. And you'll probably see that happening. So RISC-V specification really is divided into two parts. One is the ISA specification, and the second is the debug and trace specification. The ISA specification deals with the instructions. These are the instructions that your processors can execute. Uh, the two parts of the specification, and the specification is divided into two halves. There's the unprivileged instructions and the privileged instructions. And these two specifications sort of are proceeding um, in uh, out of sync with each other. Um, on the other hand, you have debug and trace specifications. So debug uh, captures how an external debugger can be connected to a platform that uses RISC-V. And similarly, a trace specification essentially tries to capture if uh, what the interface will be for a processor branch trace, as well as the encoding algorithm. So that if you are trying to build a real system where you want to have a, a, a trace engine, then what, what hardware should you actually uh, put in there so that it's compliant to the standard and can be easily uh, decoded on the other side. Now it's important to understand really the process because as, as we go forward, I think you'll, you'll see some uh, cognitive dissonance that on one hand I'm saying spec is evolving. On the other hand, I'll be talking about real silicon. So what's going on? So really let's first understand the process. The way it works is that there's usually a task group created to come up with a specification targeted for a particular set of applications. So for example, in Kamran's introduction, we talked about the special interest group of RISC-V that is looking at graphics and machine learning and trying to see 
are there instructions that can be added to the spec that will accelerate, that will reduce the power and uh, improve performance of algorithms that are of interest to graphic designers and uh, to graphics and, and ML applications? So JavaScript gets created, they come up with a specification, and then they toss that specification over to the larger community of Risk Five. And that's where the review and, and ratification process happens. Risk Five board ratifies the spec, now that's frozen in time. Now, theoretically, that's when an IT vendor, uh, a company that's actually designing Risk Five uh, processor IPs, would take that spec, implement it in, in in their processor IP, and essentially license that to some SOC design company that would actually put it on an SOC, tape out that chip, put it, on, and then eventually somebody would buy that chip, put it on a development board, and hand it over for software people to work at. Now, obviously, this the world is not as, uh, all that linear. So you will, as you will see, a lot of silicon that's out there may not be actually in sync with where the spec is. But I, over time, the specs, and now the spec that has been ratified will show up in silicon. But I wanted to give you kind of an overview of how things are, are working in the RISC-V world. Um, and obviously, if you want to contribute to any, any of these steps, then you're more than welcome to join RISC-V and, and really contribute to the spec definition part. Now let's really get into what is the RISC-V spec. So really, to think of it as, as a single monolith is, is not a good idea. We have to think of it as, as different families of a specification. But at the base of it is what we call the RISC-V integer um, ISA. That's, uh, there are two versions of it that, that are, have been ratified, the 32-bit version and the 64-bit version, so RV32i and RV64i. These are the two base ISAs on which everything is built. So every RISC-V chip that you have will implement either an RV32i or an RV64i. There are two more options, um, a 128-bit version called RV128, I and a reduced version of RV32 called RV32E. It just re reduces the number of general purpose registers to 16 from 32 in RV32I. These two have not been ratified, but you'll see them in silicon, um, RV32E more so than RV128I. But this, this really forms the foundation. Now, everything else is an extension um, on top of this base ISA. Before we go into the extensions, let's talk about what this uh, base ISA really entails. And this is where it gets interesting because when you hear the word risk five and when you hear risk five evangelist, they'll really tell you that risk five is very simple. So what is that simplicity? Well, that simplicity is in the base ISA. The base ISA has less than 40 instructions. And these are your typical instructions that you'll see on the back of your Hennessy and Patterson computer architecture book. Um, arithmetic and logic instructions with immediate and with register values, your load store branch and jump and some uh, load uh, upper immediate and, and uh, add upper immediate to PC and some e call e branch kind of instruction. So that's all there is to the risk five base ISA. You can implement this probably over a weekend and it is a same, simple process. Right? But clearly, if, if risk five was uh, just these 40 odd instructions, then we hardware designers will be out of jobs very soon and we like our jobs. So uh, there are a bunch of extensions that have been added to uh, both find the uh, better performance and lower power implementations of, of our applications. Here are some that I think this community would be probably most interested in. Um, so I've kind of highlighted those. There's the M extension, which I which is present in pretty much every RISC-V uh, silicon that you see today. It's essentially integer, multiply, and divide. There are A, uh, then you have the floating point instructions, the single precision, double precision, quad precision, the F, D, and Q extensions. Each one of them implements a floating point um, extension that's compliant to the IEEE standard. Then you have the A extension, which is essentially atomic operation. So the RISC-V uh, uh, implements a very weak consistency model and really uses the fence instruction to essentially um, synchronize the operations uh, both in the memory space as well as the IO space. But to provide more sort of support for release consistency uh, operations, these uh, atomics, and this is um, uh, 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 store conditional uh, kind of operations that, that are supported. Finally, uh, you have an extension called the C extension. Now, C extension essentially implements some of the base instructions, but in 16 bits. What um, data has shown is that about 50 to 60% of the code is these, these, these few instructions. And if you can really represent them in 16 bits, then you can get about 20, 25% of code size reduction. So C extension is fairly common in especially microcontroller applications. Uh, you'll see them implemented in most of the microcontroller or embedded uh, class RISC-V cores, uh, which also means that you can freely mix 
the 32 bit instructions with 16 bit instruction in the same code base, as long as they're aligned to the power of two. So it, it really works out neatly. It's not an exception if uh, to have a misaligned instruction. So these are really the, the uh, extensions that are of most interest probably to this group. There are other instructions that, that have recently been ratified and uh, are gaining a lot of traction, I think, in the embedded space. So uh, the first one here is called the bit manipulation instruction. So these are your typical instructions used um, in single bit clear, single bit extract, uh, single bit inverse, things like that. Very commonly found in DSP um, uh, processors or DSP applications. Uh, again, probably of interest to this community. Similarly, uh, half precision floating point and floating point instructions using the integer registers are two other extensions that are fairly common. So uh, the FD and Q essentially require you to implement floating point registers as separate hardware entities, but um, uh, this floating point registers as uh, using the integer registers as floating point is another extension that's out there. Now, probably the instruction uh, extension that has been most talked about and, and, and most dragged on in terms of ratification is the vector in section. So this is the set of uh, SIMD instructions that allow you to uh, run on a vector of 128, uh, 120, uh, 1024 bytes uh, for different vector lengths and different element widths, do all kinds of operation. It's a fairly extensive instruction. It has, I think, 300 plus instructions. So it's fairly extensive. Uh, has been in the ratification process for the last three years, but now the spec is frozen and we expect that hopefully by the end of this year, this really will be uh, ratified. A lot of hardware is out there uh, claiming to be risk five vector compliant, but it's usually compliant to an older version of this uh, spec. But I think this is where risk five can really differentiate. And in fact, it has been starting to differentiate itself from available um, from other architectures. It's obviously vector is implemented in both x86 and ARM the AVX and so forth. But um, this is where I think a lot of people are finding good application of vector. In fact, I know a few companies that are essentially using RISC-V vector cores as their backup processor to their AI accelerator to run workloads that are not optimized for their accelerator. So it's really a use case that, that we're seeing very often. And I think in the next couple of years, you should see a lot of RISC-V um, boards that support vector and really um, push the boundary on performance. There are other extensions that might not be of a lot of interest to this group, but really capture to the market of more uh, server class or desktop class applications. Um, uh, hypervisor support, supervisor support, support for physical memory protection, some cache-based operation to support different uh, consistency models, and uh, an extension that's specifically designed for scalar crypto um, operations. So what are um, available cores? Um, just a quick time check. Okay, so uh, what are some of the available cores? I'll go through some of the processor cores that are out there. So when you're looking for a RISC-V board, you'll probably find one of these cores on that board. Uh, first up uh, are two cores, two embedded class cores from Sci-5. Sci-5 does uh, application class cores as well, uh, which, which would, for example, boot Android. Um, these are their embedded cores that run basically machine mode only, uh, E20 and E30. One, uh, they both implement um, IMC. Uh, E31 also implements the A, um, A extension, as you talked about. E31 is high performance. It has a, a deeper pipeline, runs at a higher frequency, supports uh, more um, uh, flexible interrupts and so forth. You'll see this um, in, in uh, some of the boards that we'll talk about later. And essentially, these, these cores are fairly common in microcontrollers these days. Then uh, there's a Western Digital course, the SWARF family of cores. These are open source cores. You can go on GitHub and uh, download their RTL completely and put it on an FPGA or um, wherever and start running. In fact, uh, Codacip, a company has essentially built an entire tool chain around this. Uh, so you can develop the firmware and so forth um, easily on, on these cores. So the two versions of it, the high performance version is the EH2 version and the low per, uh, performance version is the EL2 version. Um, the, both of them are actually in silicon currently in Western Digital storage devices. Uh, so Western Digital has shipped out, I don't know how many billions of these uh, with these cores or some variant of these cores um, in their hardware. So these are really battle tested cores if you if you are looking to start uh, your journey on uh, open source risk five cores these are really well verified and well designed cores um, here i wanted to mention one from the pulp platform uh, out of eth zurich it's called the low risk ibex core it's a very simple core two-stage pipeline 
uh, core, uh, and that again is available as an open source project. Uh, there's a whole SOC builder around it that's also available if you want to try it. It started off as called Zero Risky, uh, but now has been rebranded as uh, IBEX and has been maintained, very actively maintained actually by, by the community. Now, moving on to some of the, so if you're if I've enticed your, <laughs> if I've wet your appetite and you want to get your hands dirty on some of the risk five hardware, uh, I will disappoint you a little bit that there's not a whole lot of options. There, there are very few options out there and very few stable options. Um, uh, but that, that will hopefully change over the next few years. I tried to find the boards that are actually available that are out, not out of stock. So, uh, so that if you want to sort of write go after this presentation and find yourself a board, then you can find something. So first I'll talk about some MCUs that you'll find on these boards. So uh, Giga Devices MCU. I know there was a presentation, uh, there was a tiny ML presentation from a Green Wave Technologies uh, about a board that actually uses this, this uh, microcontroller. Uh, this also implements IMC only, IMAC only, and uh, but it's a fairly decent microcontroller um, for, for these hobbyist uh, kind of application or something even more serious than that. Uh, there's another one um, uh, called, uh, this is using an Andy's dual core processor, Andy's Technologies dual core processor. It's a fairly high performance um, a microcontroller, uh, a decent size RAM and it actually has a decent SOC that uh, implements floating point and, and some F, uh, SMD, uh, SMD instructions as well. So this line about supporting DS, uh, DSP and SMD instructions. So there was an older spec of um, this that, that hasn't been ratified and that likely will be uh, discarded that, that is implemented here. And that's really where the fragmentation of the ecosystem kind of starts to show up. Uh, but this, this uh, you will see this in boards today. So speaking of the boards, uh, here's a board that's available for about 50 bucks um, uh, on, on Spark, Fun, uh, Spark Fun's website. It's Spark Fun Red V board. Uh, it uses the Sci-Fi E3, uh, 310 core, uh, runs at about 200, 250 uh, megahertz, and a fairly decent size. Um, it has the same same uh, um, uh, pin compatible with Arduino, so you can plug in your Arduino um, uh, peripherals or um, uh, daughter boards and connect to it, um, and really have some start to have some fun with it. Um, then uh, on a slightly higher end version is this uh, CanWrite board uh, that uses a 64-bit a dual core processor, uh, which is which is uh, not one of the uh, processors that we've talked about. This is a different, uh, they haven't published much information about the processor side, but the board itself has um, a solid functionality, you know, and a fancy LCD and so forth. This I found it online at, uh, available in some places and out of stock at others, but I think it's still in the market. Finally, you have uh, sort of on the single board computer side, you have two sort of options that are pretty um, hot these days in, in the community. Sci-5 has this Hi-5 unmatched board that is, uh, this uses a fairly high end uh, Linux compatible SOC. So you can boot Linux on it. It's, it's a single board computer, uh, 16 gigabytes of DDR. Uh, it's a fairly serious board. People have tried to put it in a server sort of uh, rack mounted uh, 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 box and really made a server out of it. But if you are serious about developing RISC-V hardware, this is, these are the two options that you have available. Uh, Star-5, which is, which is based out of China, has what's called the Vision-5 board. And that also has a dual core U74 core uh, from Sci-5 uh, implemented on it along with um, you know, camera ISP, you know, DDR, and a bunch of other peripherals that, uh, that are useful for um, development. So, um, uh, Risk Five International actually has a developers program where they uh, work with board developers uh, and give out part, um, these boards to um, early adopters and, and software developers, so that uh, we can accelerate the software development, the software ecosystem development of the software ecosystem on Risk Five. So, if you're really interested, uh, go to riskfive.org and look for the developer. Uh, developer board program. And uh, you can just uh, place a request in the form and they'll try to connect you to uh, one of the uh, board companies and have them donate a board um, to you. With that, uh, we should now turn to the software side and I'd like Kamran to uh, take it away from here. So let's move on, Kamran. Uh, thanks, Bilal. Let's uh, see where the software ecosystem for risk five stands. Uh... Well, 
the software ecosystem for risk 5 is not mature enough and uh, rapid and active developments in the ecosystem are being done to enable it become mature enough to entertain more applications uh, the software support is patchy and difficult to navigate uh, apart from that it has many gaps that need to be filled and uh, one main reason for the software ecosystem to be patchy is the isa is expanding and being ratified over time uh, talking about the OS and kernel support, the table shows those ones which have successfully been ported onto RISC-5. Uh, here, first column shows the Linux built from source, and we can see the Yocto project, which is an open source collaboration project that's, uh, that helps developers create custom Linux-based systems. Uh, the build route is a simple, efficient, and easy-to-use tool to generate embedded Linux systems through cross-compilation. Uh, the second column contains Linux distributions, with support available for RISC-5. Link to these distributions can be found on the official RISC-5 website, and some of them are Fedora, Debian, and Ubuntu. Uh, Uh, there are many distributions of RTOS whose support for RISC 5 is available out there, and uh, they include RT Thread, Free RTOS, and Zephyr. Uh, the fourth column shows Berkeley software distributions uh, uh, that are successfully ported onto RISC 5. The software community is actively working on RISC 5 support, and we may see in the snapshot that the boards being able to support Zephyr. The Zephyr's micro Python binary has not yet been ported successfully to any of the boards available, and it can be seen in the second column, which shows the status of support for Zephyr's micro Python binary for the boards. Although some of them, uh, some of the for some of the boards, it has been built, but still in the testing phase, and for others, it is still in the development phase. Uh, on machine learning and AI side, the RISC-5 has support for TensorFlow Lite in the software ecosystem for RISC-5. And uh, apart from that, support for NCNN and Andy's neural network library is also available. Uh, the NCNN support is maintained by the Tencent open source, and uh, the support for Andy's NN library is maintained by Andy's technologies. Coming towards compilers, active development is being done on the compilers that can be used to lower machine learning models down to the RISC-5 binary from the frameworks like TensorFlow and PyTorch. Uh, first one is Tensor Virtual Machine, which is a bit mature, but has some issues in it in some cases. Uh, it uses LLVM as its backend, and it targets the RISC-V architecture. It is difficult to navigate at the moment. Uh, and uh, the second one, the ERI, it is an open source project from Google. Uh, ERI is in, in its early phases of development. It is based on the MLIR dialects, the multi-level intermediate representation dialects. Uh, basically, its main focus is on high-level optimizations of machine learning models before lowering them to the lower level or the LLVM. Now, I would like to hand over the talk back to Bilal Zafar to please continue. Thank you. So I think Kamran motivated, I hope, some of you to start contributing to the risk file community. There's a lot of work to be done, and uh, especially when it comes to software porting. Um, so if you if you are interested, if you want to get engaged, uh, I would suggest, highly recommend, in fact, uh, join the risk file International. Um, it's, it's free for community membership uh, if you are joining as an individual. It's free. You get all the updates uh, on what's happening, and you can actually then plug in to one of these task groups that are either trying to port a particular piece of software uh, to risk five or uh, contribute to the development of the ISA itself or the architecture tests and so on and so forth. There's a lot of work that's going on. There's, there's work that's happening on the platform definition. So uh, we can avoid the fragmentation of the ecosystem that, that is currently a problem and will likely become a bigger problem as we go forward. Um, so there's a lot of interesting work happening on that front as well. Um, RISC-V usually hosts a summit uh, towards the end of the year. So this year is going to be mid-December. So if you're interested, uh, join RISC-V summit and, and you'll, you'll probably find out a lot more uh, about the RISC-V happenings there. Um, and finally, if you if you really do want to contribute, then, then join one of these interest groups and task committees 
uh, that are operating under risk five. We contribute to um, about three of them. Uh, one is called risk five lab. So we're trying to make hardware available to developers um, uh, so that they don't have to buy the boards. They can actually connect to the boards in the cloud. It's still some time uh, before we get there, but that's really the goal of risk five labs. Uh, there's a special interest group on architecture tests. We're trying to contribute to that as well. And uh, Kamran uh, uh, is part of the graphics and ML group. So. Uh, with that, if uh, I think we have about 20 minutes, uh, so if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, if, if you want to reach me, um, the email is on the screen. Um, waiting for your questions. And uh, yes, OS. Yeah, thank you very much, Bilal and Kamran, for a nice talk and information about the RISC-5 architecture and what's available and how we can contribute get its evolving feed. So we have a couple of questions already on the Q&A sessions. I would like to uh, read the first one for you that came in the chat. So it's from Eshi. In the low power MCU domain, what's the advantage of RISC-5 over ARM M series or DSP? Bilal, is for you. Good question. So uh, as such, RISC-5 as an ISA doesn't offer an advantage point blank, right? One can't say that RISC-V as just the ISA will be better than um, ARM. What it really comes down to is the implementation. So at, at a very, uh, so what happens is that over time, ISAs accumulate legacy uh, that cannot be removed from, from that ISA. So I think RISC-V having started um, fresh allows processor design companies. So people who are designing these MCUs to essentially take a look and take a fresh and cleaner approach to implementing a much more constrained ISA, a much more refined ISA um, than, than what ARM has. But currently, frankly, there's really no comparison. ARM is light years ahead in terms of the software ecosystem support that's available. So, but over time, I expect um, a lot more RISC-V vendors will target ultra low power uh, applications because of the simplicity of the ISA, they'll be able to offer really low power um, uh, devices. And that can un unlock sort of potential in, in this domain um, that, that uh, more legacy ISAs may, may have a difficulty doing. Very similar to how x86 had a difficulty sort of making inroads into in the mobile space. I think um, uh, there's a good shot for, there's a good, um, there's a good opening for risk five vendors. And frankly, that's where the opportunity right now is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bilal. So there's another question from Mark Donaldson. Is there an existing integration of the risk five architecture with FPGA ASIC or also wireless radio front ends that are open source? Um, on FPGA ASICs, yes, Polaris has some boards uh, on which they basically just take an FPGA and burn a RISC-V core on top of it uh, to give you a RISC-V board. Um, I don't know about RF front-end integration. Uh, um, uh, I could look it up and check, but I, I, I don't know of one, sorry. Yeah, and there's a follow-up from also Mark. Uh, the cost to design and develop a license-free RISC-V SOC may be high for startups or early entrants. Do you see a way to use econ economies of scale to deliver what's most needed to deliver today's intelligent IoT embedded systems, for example? Well, oh, that's a very good question. I really like that question because that's that's that hits to the that gets to the heart of this, right? That it's true. Licensing a proprietary ISA used to be very expensive. Um, by the way, the challenge from Risk Five is forced ARM to also lower the licensing cost for its uh, simpler uh, course. But uh, that's still true. It's still a prohibitive cost for uh, for a startup. So definitely, if you are a startup that is thinking of doing your own processor core, whether that's on an FPGA or um, especially if it's an ASIC, then Risk Five becomes the right starting point because you know that you won't be tied down by royalty costs. The other advantage of having a risk five um, as your base um, uh, to work off of is that they're fairly good uh, open source implementations, open source RTL available for you to get started. And I'm seeing that a lot. A lot of startups that are adopting risk five are not starting from scratch. They're taking an existing open source core, trying to build their MVP just with that core or adding uh, you know, the customization that they need for their particular use case. And then moving forward, over time, you can refine that core. So really, I think this open ISA has unleashed that possibility, which really didn't exist, right? You couldn't take the ARM spec. I couldn't take an ARM spec, write my own ARM RTL and offer it to the world for free. 
But with RISC-V, we can do that. And in fact, already there are fairly good uh, quality cores that are available, like I said, from uh, Pulp Platform on ETH Zurich, um, from ETH Zurich, and um, the SORF course from Vashon Digital, and um, the course that we talked about from sci -Fi. So there are plenty of good quality cores that are available out in the open source that any startup can take to you know, get to their MVP, and then they can start customizing it and improving upon it. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Another one we have, uh, given that RV chips will support different extensions, how then will render distribute libraries efficiently? Ha, 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 ha. I wish anybody knew the answer to that question. <laughs> So this is the question that I think the ecosystem is struggling with the most, uh, which is that um, how do we make sure that we provide that modularity and flexibility in terms of uh, hardware implementation, but at the same time, uh, provide a view to the software ecosystem that doesn't become fragmented and no library can run on uh, sort of two RV uh, chips. And I think the, the answer to that, that the community is kind of converging towards this definition of platforms. So platform will essentially indicate a set of um, uh, specifications that essentially make up that platform and then libraries will be ported to that platform and any chip that, that's essentially compliant to that platform, the libraries will be able to um, run on it. But it, it, this this really is the Achilles heel of uh, Risk Five, to be honest. My view of and, and view of many of the participants is that this is really the challenge because um, there is no central body that's saying that this is a Risk Five chip and this is not a Risk Five chip. Yes, there are compliance tests, but anyone can 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 design a piece of hardware um, and and that is you know branded as a Risk Five uh, piece of hardware. So there is that real risk of fragmentation that the community has to. Um, guard against. And uh, I guess I'll say again, if, if you're worried about that uh, risk, then join up. That's what we're doing. I guess that's true about a lot of open source. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. And uh, what high level optimizations are being targeted in IREE? -E? So uh, basically they are targeting the constant folding as well, but the, the main uh, optimizations that they are targeting are the operator fusions that can be done on the high level before getting it towards the low level where we lose a lot of information about the operations. And uh, uh, so that's why they are uh, going towards high level optimizations where they will be doing operator fusions. All right. Thank you, Kamra. So we have another one question from Maxim. Can you elaborate on the extension of uh, V extension with custom instructions for data? organization and SIMD operations for ML, so forth. How does Kamran typically think about it? Do you start from the accelerator architecture and then define instructions based on the interface? Uh, well, yeah, so basically, firstly, the workload is being, uh, you know, generated from the applications. The workload is generated and then uh, some different uh, experiments are being done on them like where we can achieve maximum performance uh, from that and which operations are being used uh, more. So keeping that in mind, the extensions are being ratified over time. Right, yeah. Thank you again. So I'll add a little bit to this. So the, the V extension will be a standard extension that will not be custom. So this will be a set of instructions that will be ratified that this is what a V extension is. What we're seeing in the market is that a lot of companies are taking a RISC-V processor with, let's say, uh, v, v instructions implemented, but also attaching their own custom accelerators or custom coprocessors with it. Uh, this is their secret sauce, the, the custom coprocessor. The, so they target the bulk of their application workload onto their coprocessor or their custom uh, hardware. And whatever is left over, whatever their software toolchain cannot support on, on that custom hardware or whatever is just not optimally, uh, cannot optimally run on their hardware, they essentially offer Offload that to a RISC-V processor. Really, that's where the use case that we're seeing a lot um, from these um, AI ML hardware companies uh, come in. Yeah, thank you. Ma. So we have, uh, I guess that's somehow a lot students will be looking for the answer. As a graduation project team, we need to contribute to the field of edge AI to implement neural network in microcontroller application. What advice you give us? Ah, uh, uh, what advice do I give? Uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, I would say don't reinvent the wheel. Uh, I think there's a lot of good stuff that's already been done. Uh, so start from that, uh, identify a good use case, identify what I see in uh, sort of graduate studies not happen is uh, looking at the power performance uh, ang aspects, both, so power and performance. So look at that power performance angle and make something real, man. 
that that's all I would say. Uh, make something real, leverage what's already done, and uh, build something cool. Good luck. Yeah, cool. Uh, so we have another one. Is there any existing Android OS port for this five for mobile use cases? So yes and no. Uh, so Alibaba's team has ported Android open source project AOSP to uh, a, a Risk Five hardware that they have, a Risk Five platform that they have, but it's not. You can't download. Uh, you, you can't buy that piece of hardware. Uh, they do, and that's an internal piece of hardware. Um, eventually, I believe by hopefully by next year, we'll start to see hardware um, in whether it's probably in a tablet form factor that actually has Risk Five processor in it and it will be running some some version of AOSP. Um, uh, and that that's probably where the starting uh, that's where it starts. But my my hunch is that it's going to come out of uh, come out of China, and it's probably going to be in you know, a tablet form factor. They've done demos of it, so if you go on YouTube and look for Android on Risk Five, you'll probably find that uh, demo. But it's really in that sort of early phase still. It'll probably take a year or so before it matures and is available for one of us to hold in our hands and say this is Android running on Risk Five. Yeah. Is there any IS extension on micro architecture specially designed for low power deep learning applications? Okay. So uh, ISA is different from micro architecture. So ISA says, here's a load instruction. Uh, this is the this is the functionality of this instruction. This is what this instruction should do. For example, it should read the register value from here and here and save the end result here. Uh, Microarchitecture says, what are those gates? What is that hardware that actually implements this instruction? So, uh, and RISC-V is very, very um, uh, clear in not making microarchitectural um, sort of decisions in the instruction set itself. So they keep the instruction set just at the functional level and letting the microarchitects, people who are actually designing the processor to implement their own strategies and their own schemes and their own circuits of implementing this these instructions. So really ISA uh, is, is, uh, does not sort of um, uh, define the microarchitecture. And in case of RISC-V that divorce is very, very sort of permanent um, anyway. Now, when it comes to defining instructions that are useful for AI ML applications, that's definitely the case. So that is the primary use case for something like a vector um, instruction. So a vector instruction is essentially operating this, doing the same operation on a, ton of, uh, on a lot of bits. Right, so essentially it can be a vector of let's say length 256 bytes of with each element being you know, 64 bits each and you're doing the same operation on them. So this is what we call the single instruction multiple data SIMD operation. That's really uh, what vector instructions do. And the primary use case for them is uh, these days in uh, ML applications where you're doing the same operation over a whole matrix or something. So matrix multiply and so forth. And uh, Kamran can speak more to the ML task group that's trying to define if there are other instructions that will be more useful in Excel in speeding up ML applications. That's what the job of that task group is that uh, Kamran is working with. All right. So we have another one from Maxim. What do you think of the intermediate representation as the abstraction layer for accelerators? How does it fall into the design methodology? And what are the trade-offs, limitations for the optimization on high level and low level? Uh, it's a good question. So the basically the purpose of intermediate representation is to bring reusability. Uh, we can reuse that. Uh, the intermediate representation is used and optimizations are done over them. Uh, so it's common between the languages and the architectures. Uh, apart from that, uh, the optimizations on high level and low level, uh, there obviously are some trade-offs as well as uh, some advantages. If you look at the low level, we can do optimizations that are you know, directly related to our targeted architecture. One optimization might be good for one architecture, while it might be not good for another. So these optimizations must be done at the low level. Uh, and some optimizations are language dependent, like uh, operator fusion in machine learning is uh, can't be done at the low level. So that must be done on the high level. Uh, Eri is targeting that. Right. Thank you, Kamran. So we have another one question, I guess. Uh, if you don't consider micro architectures, how can you define instruction extension of complex diverse application like ML? 
Right, so the microarchitecture defines how that instruction gets implemented, right? What are the gates and the wires and the flip-flops that you're using to do that? When you're trying to define an instruction set architecture, you're trying to see that for a given set of benchmark applications, and this is typically how this work gets done, for a given set of benchmark applications, what are the common operations that we see a lot, right? And, you, and then the next question is that for those common operations, do the existing instructions, the basic load store, add, subtract, branch, compare, those instructions, do they offer the right uh, performance point uh, and, and, uh, for them? Or do we need to add another instruction that essentially allows us to do things in a more efficient way? Uh, so to give you an example, right? So uh, take a normal sort of um, uh, uh, load store instruction. So normal load store instruction works very well for data. Right. Uh, I want to bring some data into the processor from the memory I'll issue a load. I want to store something into the memory I'll issue a store. However, if I'm trying to implement some kind of a lock or a semaphore in an operating system or, or something, a normal load, load store would not work because things it can get changed. So I can I can do a load and think somebody else can come and change that. Another processor can come and change that before I do a store. So I might have read a stale value. So there you need load reserve store conditional kind of operations. So that's the instruction you would add. That's, for example, what is in the A extension. Similarly, in these extension instructions that are added to a vector are you look at the application and you say, oh, this application uses a lot of, um, uh, does a lot of, for example, add or multiply on this, uh, in, uh, on a chunk of data. So maybe it's a matrix multiplication operation. I need to take four bit or uh, four byte or eight byte elements. And I need to do a bunch of multiplications on it. Instead of doing them individually, load one operation, load one operand, load the other operand, multiply, store the result back, then load the next two operands and multiply and store the result back. What if we were able to uh, orchestrate this as a single instruction that can do, for example, 256 elements of multiplication? What would be the end result of that? That would probably be faster and lower power. So that's really how you come up with these uh, instructions. And, and that's really what, what the job of these architects uh, is they look at the application, common operation, and from that derive what are the right set of instructions that allow us to do that. Yeah. So we have a follow-up question from the Maxim, uh, continuing the same thread. So he's saying, if you say convolution 2D, there's a lot of ambiguity how the instruction is implemented in microarchitectures. Should it stall the pipeline? How should it fetch memory? What if it is not in the scratch pad, et cetera? That's correct. That's correct. So that's where the magic of hardware designer comes in, where the hardware designer says that, okay, the ISA defines this as an instruction, but in the use cases, I want to be able to do X, Y, Z in a really fast way. So for example, one of the most um, common um, uh, one of the most common uh, optimization is that I want to be able to run instructions out of order. So they don't have to, you know, instruction A that shows up in the program before instruction B uh, doesn't have to run before B. It can run after B if it's stalled for some reason. So those are the kind of optimizations that now instruction set architecture does not define that. That's what the microarchitecture of the processor does. Now it's the job of the hardware to actually guarantee that the final results are still the same. So uh, when we get to defining the microarchitecture, that's when we're looking at this architecture and the use case and really trying to differentiate. That's why you know processor from company A might be better than processor for company B, even though they both implement the same instructions. That's really the beauty of the microarchitecture of a processor and that's what microarchitects do. Thank you, Bilal. And I guess we'd like to thank our speakers uh, for a very much nice and encouraging and motivating talk. And if you have any further questions and follow-ups, please do uh, log into the tiny ML uh, forums and just ask your questions. And uh, the, our speakers will be very much happy to answer your queries. So let's move forward. Again, we'd like to thank our strategic partners, uh, our strategic partners, Arm AI, uh, powering tiny ML innovation, Arm AI virtual talk, uh, virtual tech talks, Edge Impulse, the leading edge ML platform, Qualcomm AI research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous, Sentient neural decision processors, ML training pipeline, end to end deep learning solutions for tiny ML and edge AI, or platinum strategic partners. Deep Light, fastest video analytic solutions on ARM CPUs. Kiki Tech, 
the global IoT solutions, reality AI, add advanced sensing to your product with Edge AI, tiny ML, broad and scalable edge computing portfolios from the ARM core, Renesis, our goal strategic partners, Photohub, Maxim Integrated. Maxim Integrated enables the edge intelligence through advanced AI acceleration, low power Cortex M4 micros, sensors and signal conditioning. Latent AI, adaptive AI for the intelligent edge, and XP Semiconductors, Seed uh, Studio, the IoT hardware enabler, NCML, build smart IoT sensor devices from the data, SD, live augmented, Sensense, build sensing and interface hardware for ultra low power applications, our silver strategic partners, and uh, just reminder again about the next Tiny ML talk. It's on Friday, uh, May 6th. Manivan Sivan, lead engineer on the computer vision platform, value, industry 4.0, predictive maintenance using Arduino at 7 and Edge Impulse. The web start will start at 7 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, again, if you want to uh, interested in presenting a talk, register on talks at tinyml.org. Uh, again, for copyright notice, if you are uh, just don't, if you want to make sure you don't share the things and the multimedia file is copyright of Tiny ML Foundation, all rights reserved. So you, you have to refer whenever you, you want to reproduce any material. And thank you very much for all of your participation. And again, I would like to thank our speakers for such a nice talk.